we want to hear what you have to say. So our goal is to make this format as welcoming to meaningful input and participation as possible. To do this, I'd like to point out a few features. The chat box, which many of you have found already. Yes, hello, Kenny. Um, is in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Feel free to chat your questions or comments at any time during the meeting. There will be some set points during the presentation where we will go through questions. You also have the opportunity to use the raise your hand button located on the top control bar if you would like to speak your question or comment. This button looks like a person raising his hand. Lastly, we would ask that unless you are speaking, you please mute yourself so we can avoid background noise. If you are on your phone, simply use your phone's mute button. Or if you are using computer audio, hit the phone icon at the top of the screen to mute yourself. At this point, I'm going to turn the floor over to Jenny Humphreys to kick off this meeting. I look forward to talking with you in the chat box and at the pauses for questions. Thanks, Victoria, and welcome back, everyone, to the next, the second Freight Advisory Committee meeting for the Berkeley, Charleston, Dorchester Regional Freight Mobility Plan. I hope some of you got a chance to participate in our lunchtime lunch and learn uh, first in a series of freight-related uh, webinars. So uh, today we have a very packed agenda. I know Sarah distributed a. Um, copy of today's PowerPoint presentation to you all. Uh, you probably saw that there are a lot of slides in there, but I don't want you to feel intimidated or, or bogged down by the quantity of information. Our project team's been very busy over these last several weeks getting some of our, our early work put together. And our goal for today is to give you an overview of the work that has been done and also have opportunities to stop and pause and talk about it. I think what you'll see, I know that what we see, and I hope you see it as well, uh, whenever we develop plans like this, we can only do so much with the data we have available. So what we try to do is put that in front of you all, people who know the community, you know your, your roads, you know where you're driving, you know where you've got to move goods, and you know what's happening in your neighborhoods. Um, so what we have to do is put the data in front of you so that you can reflect on it and tell us if the, if the data is correct. Is it valid? Is this the right, the right path forward? So um, you're going to hear a lot from my colleague, Roger Schiller, for, uh, for the duration of this meeting. And we're going to go through a series of, of those work products. Um, we will have designated stop and pause moments to ask you some targeted questions, some specific polling type questions, but then also please at any time uh, type a question in the chat box or as Victoria mentioned, you can raise your hand to ask a question. The first two topics today, going over the state of freight and taking a look at our regional freight network. Um, that is a, a big ticket item that we want you to review and digest and provide feedback on because that, that becomes a significant input to our next phases of work. So we want to make sure that we're starting off on the, on the right path there with, with those analyses and make sure we're looking at the right things. So please, please chime in and give us your feedback. And then the latter part of our meeting will be focused on um, findings from peer reviews, looking at other communities and their freight planning and technology experiences. So we'll, we'll um, also include that in today's presentation. Uh, moving forward, what we would love is over the next couple weeks, as you, as, you, as you have more time to digest this information and review the materials, please provide additional feedback beyond today's meeting. Uh, pass that through Sarah Cox at BCD COG. So um, before we jump completely in, Sarah, were there any thoughts or messages you wanted to share with the group before we get started? Thank you, Jenny. Could you all hear me clearly? Yes. Oh, I just wanted to um, thank everyone who took the time to join us today. Um, again, 
just to echo what Jenny said, we are presenting some preliminary findings um, that was done to date. Uh, we definitely want to encourage feedback or any um, impressions you have that definitely would shape um, our process and add to the value of our product. So I'm really excited, and again, I want to thank CDM for the work they're putting in, and let's have a great So moving forward, we've got my colleague Roger Schiller with us. He'll be presenting some information today, and um, let's see what Roger has to share with us. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jenny. Can you all hear me okay? Yep, you sound good. Okay. Um, so first of all, you know, what's the purpose of this task, this first task that we're um, sharing results from? Basically, just uh, develop a draft freight network um, and evaluate it, uh, you know, evaluate the performance on that network with a focus on truck and rail operations. Um, so the first kind of subheader here is the state of freight. Um, this is just a high level discussion of what commodity flows in the region look like. Uh, so first of all, you know, what do we mean uh, when we're talking about freight? Essentially, it reflects uh, the the consumption and production and trade of physical goods within the economy. There's a lot of different ways you can measure that. Um, there's, you know, by volumes, total tons, value, whatnot. Also by mode, truck, rail, uh, air, and marine for this region. Um, what direction is the are the freight is the freight going in? Is it inbound to the region, leaving the region, um, strictly going through the region? And then also what commodities are being carried? Um, and that all informs the kind of the economic impacts uh, of, of freight, which is one of the future tasks in this project project to estimate, um, you know, what the uh, what the total economic value of the freight industry is for the, the three county region. Um, and the the first step in that um, process is to kind of um, look at the uh, the IHS market transfers database, which is a proprietary freight flow database. Um, origin destination data for uh, by commodity and by mode down to the county level um, for South Carolina. Um, so the first cut that we do with that is to look at the, the total network tonnage density for both the road and the rail networks. Um, later on, we'll get into different ways to slice and dice the data, uh, looking at you know commodity splits, uh, directionality, like I said. Um, also, or key origin destination pairs, you know, what are the major trading partners for this region? Where is the freight uh, coming from and going to mostly? Um, that will all come later. Uh, the first step was just to get this preliminary 30,000 foot overview uh, to sort of check the transfer totals and then um, act as a lead in to the later tasks, which will include the detailed commodity flow and uh, economic analysis. So when we uh, look at the network density, um, the, uh, this is what we get. Uh, so the, the truck map is on the left and the rail map is on the right. Um, the line widths correspond to the total tonnage um, and the, the colors show the, the share of that tonnage is just moving through the region versus you know, originating or destined for it. Um, no big surprise, I-95 is the major truck corridor in this region, and almost all of it is through freight um, up and down the eastern seaboard. Um, obviously, there's also a lot of port-driven rail traffic um, coming from on, on the NS and CSX railroads, uh, as well as on um, I-26, there's a lot of uh, port-generated truck traffic. Um, so our first polling question is, Basically, do these overall patterns look, you know, reasonable from from your experience uh, based on what you know about the region? And I can go back to that slide so you can uh, look at it while we're while you're answering the poll. So we're thinking about you know total volumes um, as well as as uh, how much of it is through traffic. Right now, Roger, it's uh, 
four people have said yes. Okay. Yeah, we, we can go ahead and close the poll. So it's, it's encouraging that, that uh, you know, trans search appears to have gotten the overall patterns correct. Um, that will that'll be use, useful to have as we dive into the more detailed uh, analysis of data. Um, does anybody have any any open-ended questions about you know what we've already discussed so far about what was in the trans search data or the upcoming tasks that we're going to be doing? Feel free to unmute your mic and ask it, or type your question in the chat box. I don't see any questions in the chat box yet, Roger. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't really see anybody typing, so oh, somebody is. Okay, we have we have one person typing. Do we have figures on interstate versus intrastate freight leaving our port? Um, that is going to be pretty hard to suss out from TransSearch because the, um, uh, the, the the lowest geography that you can get to in TransSearch is counties. Um, so you, know, you could probably reasonably assume that a, a, a lot of the, uh, maybe even the majority of the freight um, Coming out of uh, out of that county, is it Charleston County? Um, would be related to the port, but there's no way that you can use transfers to really figure that out. Um, one of the next steps that our economists are going to take is to look at the Corps of Engineers uh, waterborne commerce statistics data. That's a, a better source of uh, maritime freight flows, um, but it also is not going to really tell you uh, what right after it leaves the harbor, necessarily. So um, there's a lot of different data sources, and unfortunately, none of them are comprehensive, really. So you have to piece together what you have from, from different data sources to tell the story for the region. Kenny said um, the state port authority should have a good breakdown. Yeah, and we'll be we'll be looking at their numbers too. They they usually um, track with the Corps of Engineers waterborne data. Matt said the Ports Authority Authority uses Peers data. It's expensive. Yeah, that's a subscription service. Yep. And then a follow-up question from Charles. How much is leaving the port on rail or truck than transitioning to the other mode while still in state? Uh, we haven't taken a deep enough dive yet to get at that uh, information, um, but that's something that we can look at as we move forward in the commodity flow analysis. Yeah, Roger. I'll, I'll add. Oh, Roger, sorry, this is Hampton ahead. Lee. Uh, twenty five percent of our uh, of our volume is is uh, leaves here by rail. Okay. And I suspect a good bit of it ends up in a place like you know, Dillon or Greer, and then it might move to another mode. Co correct. Yep. Yeah. You're exactly right. And on the on the other question, you know, uh, with the exception of some of the BCOs that we deal directly with. Um, once the motor carriers leave our port facility, we, we really don't know which direction, you know, they're, they're heading in. They could leave 17 South or 526 or I-26, you know, if they're leaving from North Charleston. So we, yeah. we it's, uh, it's hard for us to track where, where the heaviest lanes are. 
Yeah, you can you can get some data sources that'll give you truck GPS records, but it won't tell you anything about what's on the trucks. Correct. Um, yeah, you can look at origin destination patterns to and from the port, but uh, that, that that won't tell you anything about commodity or value or anything like that. Right, and and I mean the only commodities we know are the BCO commodities. The other the other containers that move through here. Or, or widgets for us. We just we just load them to the trucks or load them to the ship. We don't we don't know where they generated from or where they're going to. Yeah. And this is Jenny Humphrey. It's just to reiterate something Roger mentioned. Um, there's no one perfect source, Charles, for telling us exactly where a truck is coming from or going to. Um, as he mentioned, we we splice together a lot of data sets. So these initial maps are predominantly transearch commodity flow databases, which are incredibly valuable and, and contain a lot of proprietary data about those origins and destinations broken down by commodity type and by mode. Um, but it is not 100% complete. So um, we do then complement that with Sears data. We complement it with traffic count data. Um, other types of data sources so that we get a pretty good idea of where everybody is coming from and going to. Um, and it is very difficult to very clearly state that this truck is coming from the Ports Authority or, or one of our port terminals. Um, just, you know, shy of putting a counter outside of the gate. Um, you know, once trucks hit the interstate, they're heading in lots of different directions. You know, some are heading completely out of the region. Some are headed to a railhead, which, you know, approximately 25% of that is going to a railhead to move out by rail. And then there are lots of interim steps along the way within the study area. So um, the next step in our analysis is to, as Roger mentioned, break that down on a much more detailed level so that we can take a look at commodity types and are those local trips versus longer distance trips. Um, and all that good stuff. So we will have a, a, a deeper dive on that over these next couple of months. So I, yeah, there is there will a be lot of discussion. Time. Yeah, I hope that <laughs> answers the question. Yeah, and there, there will be another lunch and learn uh, uh, or, you know, advisory committee meeting uh, to, to go over those materials as well. All right, um, so moving on, um, the next uh, key task that we did was to come up with this draft uh, BCD regional freight network. Um, and that's an important first step to establish, you know, what, what is the regional freight network so you can start uh, measuring and monitoring performance on it and understanding needs. Um, our basic methodology was to look at uh, the existing uh, already designated national and state freight networks and just include those by default. Um, and com we combined that with information that we gleaned from TransSearch as well as the BCD COD travel demand model um, about truck traffic patterns and key freight generators. Um, we mapped the freight generators which came from TransSearch um, as well as uh, the industry clusters that we knew about and then kind of reviewed the highest volume truck corridors from the uh, BCD model um, to see which ones were carrying the most trucks. Um, generally, that was the top three out of uh, the five sort of natural breaks categories um, that the GIS software divided it into. And then we visually selected additional links just to achieve uh, network continuity. And then we also took a stab at tiering it um, into at least the highway network um, into uh, three tiers for, to kind of, kind of suss out, um, you know, interstate trade corridors versus statewide significant freight corridors versus local last mile connectors. That is what we got um, uh, when we did that exercise. Uh, this is just the, the overall network that we developed both for truck and um, uh, rail modes. And then we also uh, superimposed those freight generators that I was talking about as well as the facilities like the Palmetto Commerce Park, um, intermodal facilities, port terminals, uh, Volvo Camp Hall, things like that, and, and on the map, so you can see how um, how those things relate to each other. Um, this is a pretty busy map, uh, but basically the the bubbles are essentially the the freight generators from TransSearch, um, 
the larger dots mean more more freight is generated by those facilities. Um, the purple one, ones are what what are called, um, or rather the green ones are what are called non-freight generators, uh, which is kind of a transurge term, meaning a, a facility that only receives freight but doesn't ship it out. Most of the freight in the region is coming from those purple dots, though. And then we included all of the freight railroads uh, just uh, by default, given their importance in, in regional freight movements. Um, so one of the things, like I said, that we're trying to ins uh, understand are what are the most important first and last mile freight connections in the region. Uh, so we have another poll coming up, and this is just um, uh, an open-ended poll. Uh, if, if you see anything on the map that we missed, um, or if there's anything that specifically comes to mind that we need to be sure and include, uh, we'd be happy to, to hear about that. Feel free to type your comment or make a comment um, by raising your hand or unmuting yourself. No results yet, Roger, but I'm sure people are, are thinking hard about it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, when we were reviewing the network, we, we, we tried to drill into, uh, uh, you know, what are those, are those roads that were really acting as driveways to the port terminals and capture those. Port Access Road, I-526, yeah. Mm -hmm. First mile between the Wanda Welsh terminal and the rail ramps. Okay. And then just connections from the port to the interstate. Okay. That's all good feedback. We can circle back and make sure we captured all of those. And then um, the next question is uh, basically about suggestions for additional routes that should be included in the draft freight network. And if I remember correctly, this is a multiple choice one. Um, yeah. So these were some routes that we, we sort of got feedback about that might be important for freight. Um, they they weren't, weren't necessarily supported by the data that we had, but like Jenny said, the data kind of is what it is. It's, uh, it can be imperfect. So. Um, you know, whichever ones of these you think are um, are critical to include, uh, we'd be happy to, to look, learn more about that. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm seeing a pretty clear pattern. South Carolina 41, US 52, and US 78, okay. All right, uh, moving along. So the, the next step was to look at this draft network that we created and then um, you know, do an operational analysis of, you know, what's going on on the network, how it's performing from a freight standpoint, both infrastructure-wise and congestion-wise and, and things like that. Um, fundamental for any freight study is, you know, what are the bridge and the pavement conditions like um, in the region. Uh, the pavement on the left-hand side map there, uh, on the Tier 1 routes, it's generally performing pretty well. Uh, local and regional routes like US 17 and US 52 show a few more pavement issues. That's not too surprising. The state DOT is probably going to uh, you know, prioritize those, those higher-level routes for, um, uh, for maintenance projects. Um, we did look at the SCDOT bridge condition ratings as well. That's the map on the right. And there were four bridges that were rated in poor condition, uh, according to that database, um, that are also on our freight network. 
Um, and, and we also reviewed the National Bridge inventory data for uh, clearance and load restrictions, but we actually didn't find any uh, vertical clearance issues, at least none below 15 feet uh, on our network, and none of the bridges seem to be posted for load either. Um, truck involved crashes is another important consideration. Um, for this one, we just selected out the, the severe crashes uh, on the network. So these are the ones that involve one or more fatalities or incapacitating injuries. Um, not too surprising, the hotspots are where more of the truck traffic tends to concentrate, like I-26 and uh, US-78. Um, we took a look, quick look at grade crossings. This just shows where they all are in the region. Um, obviously, most of them are on the CSX and Norfolk Southern main lines. Um, one of the things we want to look, look at later on is which grade crossings are um, uh, contributing to a lot of congestion um, on the freight network, uh, you know, where they intersect with busy roads. They, uh, and the train, train, train is present, they might be uh, creating a lot of congestion in the region, so we'd like to take a high-level assessment of that. Uh, we also looked at some, or identified some potential grade crossing safety hotspots. Um, these are all based on uh, total train and vehicle collisions from 2009 to 2019. Um, and they I can hear you, Roger. Uh, so, uh, so, so somebody lost sound, so. Um, <clears throat> anyway, moving along, truck, truck vehicle hours of delay. We got this metric from the um, regional travel demand model. It appears, at least in the current year, there's, there's not a whole lot of truck delay. Um, except for on I-526 and along Clements Ferry Road. Uh, those were where the, the hot spots seem to be. Um, looking at level of service for all vehicles, so this is not just trucks, it's everything. Um, there's obviously some congestion on I-526 and I-26. Uh, Clements Ferry Road again came up here and just Overall, overall, there's a lot of local and regional routes that are serving the port and some of the freight intensive businesses in the area that um, uh, are likely experiencing some congestion in the peak hour. We uh, identified some preliminary freight bottlenecks or truck bottlenecks based on truck GPS records. Uh, those were scored using um, two different metrics that we derived from, from the truck speed data. Uh, one of them is frequency of congestion, um, which is just the, 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 you know, the percentage of the time that a particular seg segment is congested. And the other one is the planning time index, which is a measure of, of reliability for a region or for a, a, a roadway. Um, and that, is, that, that sort of t tells you how much extra time a trucker would have to budget into their, their travel plans to, to make it somewhere on time. Uh, when we combined those two scores, uh, we developed kind of an ordinal scale from uh, you know, 7 to 10 to describe bottlenecks. Uh, so the red ones are the, are the worst ones based on this particular metric. Um, in some cases, we might just be capturing intersection delay here. That's a little bit hard to suss out from this data, but it does, it does give you kind of another um, another data source to look at for where trucks might be getting delayed. And then uh, finally, we also looked at truck parking supply um, in the region. Uh, just This is just where the parking is located and approximately you know, how many spaces they have at each one. Um, most of the supply in this region is on I-26 and I-95, which is not too surprising. Um, there's comparatively little supply uh, near, near the port or 
some of the big freight generators close, closer into the Charleston region. Um, and this is important because if truckers can't find a place to park, they'll tend to park illegally, especially with the new electronic logging device mandate. They, um, uh, they, they, they have to stop essentially when, when their time runs up. So uh, that creates safety and quality of life issues when they're parked on the shoulder or somewhere like that. Um, most of the parking in this region is privately owned. Um, and there, there were some field surveys that were conducted, I think, in 2018 for the I-26 corridor management plan, and they, they found um, truck parking lots of, uh, at several locations were at or above capacity during the nighttime peak period. Uh, so it's very possible that there is a, a deficit of truck parking in this region. Uh, so that was a whole lot of maps that I just threw at you, so, you know, happy to take any any questions about what you just saw um, uh, on the network analysis? That was a lot. Thanks, Roger. <laughs> Feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask your question aloud or type it in the chat box. I don't see any questions yet, and no one is typing. I hope it's clearly understood by the group that when we look at these different metrics, some of the ones that we tend to go back to are those indices, the travel time indices, um, because as many of you may be familiar, when you're a, a traditional transportation plan, we'll look at a roadway and its level of service. Is it uh, free flow, is it heavily congested, but a travel time index in in most great mobility planning experience it tells a better story for drivers and users of the network. Um, so that's part of why we go back to that metric, because it, it, it's nearly impossible to assume that you can develop a plan that gives you ac acceptable levels of service for an urban interstate, for example. Um, but the reliability is what is really necessary at the end of the day so that drivers can have the predictable times of day that they can move through the network and um, make, their, make their schedules work efficiently and plan around those reliably congested times of day. Yeah. See, Charles is typing. Also, feel free to unmute and ask your question aloud if you would like. I see a few folks typing. Diane says, as a side note, SCDOT Freight Programs Office will be embarking on a statewide truck parking analysis and study. Sarah has asked, does the new HLT accommodate any kind of truck parking space? I don't know enough about the new uh, terminal to answer that question. If, if Matt's still on the phone, you might know. Or do you, Jenny? Uh, this is Hampton at the Port Authority. Uh, right outside the um, the, the the uh, security gates uh, as the trucks enter into the um, facility, there is a, a parking lot to the right uh, that that trucks can use um, if if they need to pull over there and, and you know to get paperwork straightened out or, or, or whatever, and then um, and then they would proceed onto the terminal. 
you know, it depending on what time they got there, if they were there early enough and you know needed a few hours to stay there, they could they could sit there until the gates opened up. Yeah. Okay. So it is a 24-hour facility, Hampton. Excuse me. It is a 24-hour facility that uh, OTR truck parking at HLT. Yeah, that parking lot is outside of yeah. the terminal, so yeah. um, okay. it would be it would be available 24/7. Um, um, the the gate the gates uh, for for motor carrier freight will, will run similar to uh, or exactly like the ones for the Wando terminal in North Charleston currently, which is 5 a.m. to to 5:30 Monday through Friday, and then uh, and then six to uh, to one on Saturdays uh, currently, uh, and as volumes pick back up, then we'll expand the Saturday gate. Um, we we were running those at, at full capacity as well, but uh, during this pandemic, we've uh, cut back the hours on the Saturday gate. Yep. Thank you. Do you Hampton, do you have an talk? estimate? Okay. Yeah. What's your capacity at that lot at HLT? You know, offhand. Um, I I would say probably about 30 trucks. I can get an exact number and and uh, and, and get back to the group. But um, I I was in on the, the planning part of that, and I think it'll fit about approximately 30 trucks. Um, but I'll, I'll get some clarification on that. Okay. Okay, Charles posed a question. Yes, was a rail corridor or there was a rail corridor considered long ago to move freight from the proposed Global Gateway Port. Do the maps and data from that planning effort still exist, and would there be any sense in researching the creation of a freight-only roadway to move freight from the port to I-95, avoiding many of the congest congestion issues shown in the previous map? Uh, Charles, I can I can answer that one. Um, the global gateway plans, believe it or not, I might even have a copy on my shelf at the office, but I haven't been to my office in a few months. Um, we can certainly look at those and and absolutely getting your feedback on that. Um, you know, all all ideas are on the table at this point. Now it's the time to start brainstorming those types of ideas. Absolutely. Um, Are there any other questions? This is Hampton. Uh, going that global gateway, I, I don't know if, if those proposals are still exist or not. Um, we are we are studying other other means of um, of, of alleviating the, the traffic and congestion on um, on the on 526 through uh, mm -hmm. um, a possible barge program. So, but that's all very preliminary right now and, and still um, still being studied. That would that would move between between HLT and the Wando. A kind of cross harbor barge connection. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Well, I don't see any more uh, uh, typing or questions. So, uh, moving on. Um, one of the other tasks that we were, we were given was to assess these uh, freight planning best practices. Um, <clears throat> and for this one, we really honed in on the future uh, technology trends and applications. Um, so uh, the first you know, kind of projects that we wanted to review was uh, connected vehicles. And um, um, you know, one, one foundational question is, what do we mean by, by a connected vehicle? What is this vehicle to everything type communication or V2X? Uh, essentially, it's just the exchange of, of travel or information uh, between different types of vehicles or other transportation system users. That can be freight vehicles, passenger vehicles, the infrastructure itself, uh, even pedestrians and bicyclists, um, and other you know any connected internet device essentially. Um, and you can share all kinds of information with this technology. Um, a lot of it, as you can see on the screen, kind of revolves around safety uh, as well as traveler information. 
so that you know drivers can make better decisions about about their trip planning. Um, one of the first case studies we identified was this um, Miami-Dade ITS deployment. Uh, this was about a seven and a half million dollar project funded through FDOT and several partners down in South Florida, as well as the Florida Trucking Association. Um, and it was executed in two phases. For the first one, looked at um, or upgraded at 18 traffic signals in the region <clears throat> with. Uh, 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 DSRC technology, uh, which essentially allows for, for um, infrastructure to vehicle communications. Uh, and then there was a smart freight application as well. Um, and then phase two, they deployed 60 upgraded traffic signals uh, along the identified corridors in the region that had uh, dynamic signal priority to kind of provide green lights for freight uh, where it was feasible. And they recruited some fleets to participate. Um, and that, that test is uh, uh, going to start in September of this year and go through next October. So essentially how it works is these new traffic signal controllers are going to receive information from the trucks that are equipped with, uh, with this technology. And they're recruiting about um, 500 trucks from different regional fleets to participate. And those devices will, will communicate the location, uh, speed, and destination of, of the, uh, the truck in question so that the uh, uh, in traffic management center can process that information and then um, uh, give a priority green signal um, if it's appropriate given, you know, given conditions on the cross streets uh, and time of day and the overall traffic load for the, uh, uh, for the corridor. Some preliminary analysis of these technologies showed up to a 20% decrease in, in delays, uh, and there was associated diesel fuel savings as well as positive economic benefits just from the trucks not, not sitting in traffic so much. Uh, another connected vehicle deployment was the I-80 project in Wyoming. Um, that's about a 400-mile-long corridor. Uh, trucks make up uh, up to 70% of the traffic stream um, on the corridor at some times of year. And as you might expect in Wyoming, there's a lot of uh, extreme weather, um, high winds, uh, you know, altitude, snow, things like that, uh, which has impacts on, on driving safety, especially for commercial vehicles. So um, the overall uh, goal is to develop an application that would provide better situational awareness to the truck drivers. Uh, so that they can see upcoming hazards or get warnings um, about you know poor weather and things like that, and either stop if they have to or uh, plan the route accordingly. Um, both of these these projects leveraged a lot of uh, you know funding and expertise um, from the U.S. DOT. Uh, that's important in terms of getting uh, getting people on board uh, that know the technology and uh, can kind of relay best, best practices and lessons learned from their experiences deploying it elsewhere. Um, within South Carolina, deployment like this, uh, the funding could come from the National Highway Freight Program. And there's also a state uh, program called GuideShare that could fund a, a deployment like this. Um, one of the key lessons learned from the Wyoming one was to you know, use the entire corridor from the, the state line uh, to the you know, state line to state line across the entire uh, state, essentially. Um, that ensures maximum coverage and usage of the system when it, when it does deploy. And then recruiting private sector fleets and drivers to participate in the test, that helps gain industry buy-in and support, um, as well as matching uh, either in-kind or, 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 or financial contributions to the project. Um, when you have intensive congested arterials, um, you can capitalize on um, you know non-peak hour activity near distribution and intermodal facilities uh, to to really sort of prioritize the freight movements um, on those arterials, and that'll that'll really help the freight industry without having any negative knock-on effects to the uh, uh, commuter traffic, which is which is probably not happening at the same time of day. Um, we also looked a little bit at the uh, MASTA Regional Truck Parking Implementation Project. This was a technology deployment in, in eight Midwestern states that uh, collected and disseminated truck parking information to uh, uh, truck drivers in those participating states. 
funded through a federal grant uh, uh, with state and local matching dollars. Um, the idea was just reduce the time that the truckers have to spend for parking and provide them overall better information about where they can park. This is a spaghetti diagram that shows the data structure. Um, each state has their own uh, you know, databases and they operate independently, but the important part is they use the same data standards, uh, which in this case is an XML feed to feed into the, uh, the cloud. Um, that allows for interoperability uh, across state lines, which was key for this project. Um, the project shared parking information in a lot of different ways. Dynamic uh, signage was actually found to be the preferred method for truckers. That's what you see on the right there. Uh, just you know how many spaces are available at each exit or or rest area that they, that they're um, coming up on. But you can also push the data out to smartphone and in cab uh, devices or 511 type websites. There's a lot of different ways you can get get the information out there. Um, one of the things that helps gain funding for these types of deployments is uh, having so-called shovel-ready technology, something that's that can pretty much be deployed off the shelf. Um, they don't want to spend you know time and grant funding on developing new technologies. So having something that's ready to go can really help you win that type of support. And then just highlighting the safety uh, as well as the environmental benefits. Um, that helps to to sort of make the case and frame the argument for funding a project. Um, being scalable, like you know having those uniform data standards like the TPIMS project did, that can also be important. Um, and then just if you if you've identified a corridor, um, focusing on the, the the specific truck parking needs and user needs within that corridor um, is is important for for implementing something like this. You know what kind of information do the truckers want and and how do they want to receive it? Um, you really need to understand those things. Uh, we also took a look at the Golden Glades Truck Travel Center, which is in uh, South Florida, Miami-Dade County, um, along I-95. And this is a multimodal project. It's got both freight um, and passenger components. On the freight side, there's, there's uh, 53 truck parking spaces, um, as well as um, some you know passenger oriented stuff on the other side of it the side of it there's a park and ride and a bus terminal it connects to the tri rail system um, in uh, in South Florida and also a bike path uh, this just kind of shows the layout of the site the truck and travel center is on the right uh, there's scales there um, a leaky load containment area vehicle fueling uh, truck fueling areas, as well as some some different truck parking uh, configurations. There's a, there's about 18 spaces I think for uh, tandem trucks, in addition to the 53 regular trucks truck parking spaces. Um, one of the reasons this one got deployed was just the economic impacts. Uh, uh, the the combined project kind of maximizes that benefit of improved freight mobility, um, also address, addressing the severe truck parking shortage in the region that was identified in a lot of other studies. Um, there's a lot of industrial and warehousing uses nearby um, the Golden Glades Center, um, and they, they directly benefit from having this, this um, facility nearby. Um, and also just provides that kind of multimodal connectivity between both the passenger and the freight side. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there, there was a shortage of truck parking spaces along I-26 in Charleston, at least as of 2018. Um, so that, that presents a, a potential opportunity if a suitable site could be found. Um, maybe looking at uh, like the uh, low country rapid transit to see if there's any sites that make sense near, near there. Uh, this just kind of shows the, uh, the overall partnership structure um, between the FDOT uh, the Turnpike Enterprise and uh, various other agencies. Um, there was a concessionaire that uh, designed and built the facility for the truck parking center, um, and the land is leased from from FDOT and Florida's Turnpike Turnpike Enterprise, which provided kind of overall project management and, and support. Um, but the concessionaire designed and built the uh, the truck travel center. Um, so you know. Lessons learned from this one, just leverage the ability of uh, uh, truck-centered 
um, or availability of truck-centered operations like Loves and Flying J to construct facilities on maybe leased um, county or city-owned land, and those can be used to provide additional truck parking if it's uh, if it's appropriate. Um, and you can you can focus on areas that might tie into future expansions of the transit system, um, uh, like. Like I mentioned, the LCRT, uh, low, co low Country Rapid Transit, if there's a park and ride lot for a commuter system and there's room for, for truck parking, you could think about com combining things. Um, so we'll stop and pause there um, and just ask, uh, get some reaction from you guys. Which which of those examples that we just showed do you think is most applicable to the region? Is that only one vote casted cast for Golden Glade? Okay, another one for the ITS. You yeah. know. Okay, yeah, so it looks like the ITS connected vehicle deployment and the uh, truck parking at the Golden Glades Center were, were, were they, they, they the winners. So, okay, good to know. And uh, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, but uh, if there are any additional questions, you can either just unmute yourself or uh, um, type something in the chat box and I'd be happy to try and answer it. No one's typing yet. No one's typing, but, but I would encourage. I think we exhausted everybody. <laughs> Maybe mm -hmm. so. I'd encourage folks to unmute and so we can have some verbal dialogue in these last couple minutes if they wanted. Yeah. I see that Charles typed in um, the agreement with the. Um, park and ride idea and perhaps exploring that as an opportunity to do overnight truck parking. I think that's a very good lesson learned that we can explore and, and continue to look for examples where uh, those facilities are getting repurposed. And I can also say from planning experience in the neck area in particular, a lot of drivers are not um, personal vehicle owners. I don't have a good percentage to give you because it's been a few years since I met with a lot of those guys, but um, you know, access to a job, you kind of take for granted that some drivers aren't driving their own vehicle. So um, having that connectivity with the, with the rapid transit project and other transit opportunities are um, always a good idea to provide that access. Yep. Looks like Hampton is typing something. <laughs> Thanks for the right. update Across on the, the parking yeah. capacity. <laughs> yeah. That's good yeah. data for the, the parking capacity. It's good to know. Okay, well, seeing no other questions, I think we can wrap things up. Okay, well, thank you, Roger, for all of that information. Um, very thorough. I think it gets everybody up to date um, on where things are and where our work is progressing. And as mentioned earlier, this meeting has been recorded. so. Hopefully, those who were not able to attend live will get a chance to listen in and continue to provide their feedback over the next few weeks. 
as we head into our, our next meeting in about a month from now. Um, Charles asked a question here, how many trucks can park on an acre? Um, well, I am not a traffic engineer, but I think it depends on, on the acre itself, how it's oriented and so on. Um, does anybody have an off the cuff, back of the envelope estimate for trucks per acre? Looks like um, Kenny Skipper is providing a response here. Yeah, it depends on what type of equipment you've got is his response. And I, I think it's a it's a slightly more complicated answer than um, if you're talking about personal vehicles versus commercial vehicles. So, um, yeah, I, yeah, I think uh, I think I've seen a number thrown about for at least for you know 53 foot standard trailer tractor trailer configuration. Um, I don't remember what it is off the top of my head though. I want to say maybe 10 in the neighborhood of 10 or 12, something like that. Mm -hmm. our, um, our Illinois DOT truck parking team might uh, might have an answer. We're, we're doing a truck parking study for them, and I think they 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 were looking at that. You know, how much how many spaces could you actually get out of a given parcel? <laughs> That'll be a good one to follow up on um, mm -hmm. in our next meeting for sure. Well, I see that we're right at the two o'clock hour, so um, being mindful of everyone's time, I appreciate everybody's participation today. Thank you for the questions and. And the immediate response on some data needs and um, and other conversations. Um, anything else um, that pops up over the next few weeks, please pass it along to us, and um, we will certainly look forward to that engagement. And I'm, I'll wrap it up for now. And Sarah, were there any closing thoughts you wanted to, to communicate to the group? Thanks, Jenny. I just want to thank you all for the great work. Um, and again, we will be posting these um, presentations as well as the slides on our regional freight plan web page. Um, we will follow up to make sure if you have any comments or, or had any thoughts um, as you go through the information, definitely pass it on to myself, um, Sarah C at bcdcog.com. Um, and I believe at the end of our lunch and learn, we kind of said the next meeting would be um, tentatively August 13th. Uh, we'll be moving on, I believe, Jenny, to um, present similar findings in terms of our land use analysis would be our next engagement. Yeah. Um, and that other than that, point. I think um, thanks for everyone's participation. Thank you.